Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Megan McPeak of Monumental Sports and Entertainment. And today we have a very special conversation, a crucial conversation, a way to help our young athletes cope. And we have a presentation from Up To Us Sports as well, a panel later on. But first, the presentation from Up To Us Sports, we have Dr. Ahada McCummings, Andy Nielsen, and Nate Lejeune. So Nate, take it away for the presentation. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here and I appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah, let me just quickly introduce me and my team and so you can tag some names with faces. I am Nate Lejeune. I work with Up To Us Sports as a national training member down here in New Orleans. Let me toss it over to Andy really quick. Hey everybody, I'm Andy Nielsen. I'm a national training manager from Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Dr. Ahada McCummings. I'm the national director of strategic partnerships. Um, managing our Adidas initiative and as, as well as some others. Awesome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and make sure I am uh, unmuted here. I think that I am. Um, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Up to Us Sports. Up to Us Sports is a national nonprofit um, whose mission is uh, to recruit and train and support sports coaches uh, to inspire youth programs in their community. Our vision really is that Up to Us Sports is going to, that all, co all, all youth have access to a highly trained coach um, to help them reach their potential um, in life. I'm sorry, this is giving me a little bit of a trouble here. We've trained over 10 years, 22,000 coaches. We are truly the leader in trauma-informed coaching to help coaches engage with kids who have been exposed to violence and other negative behaviors. Um, and then finally, we really want to help address some of these mental health issues that are being exposed to our young people who are very vulnerable. Um, we've created some distance coaching tools during COVID-19 so that we can truly support and help um, supply coaches with the tools that they're going to need to help engage with their programs and the kids in their programs who've been separated from those things. And we're truly preparing and are ready to mobilize ourselves so as soon as schools and programs start to begin to be back in session so that we can be there to support our coaches to create safe places and to create really good programs we're doing that through parks uh, 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 school systems nonprofits just anyone who has a program we want to connect with them and make sure that their coaches have all the tools necessary and we're going to start digging into some of that conversation today to talk about how the recent events in our nation both COVID and the race tensions have really created some trauma that a lot of us have been exposed to and how sports can really be a great place where healing can take place. And so to do that, I'm gonna toss it over to Dr. Ahada. All right. Um, so as we start to talk a little bit about the impact on, on our players, um, this current uh, climate that we're in, and I, I think it's kind of fitting that we're doing this today in, um, and it's Juneteenth. And so just in recognition um, of Juneteenth and what all of that means for not just our communities, but for the nation at large. And so um, as we start to talk a little bit about what is that impact, right, that kids have been experiencing as they've been doing social distancing, um, and then also what's going on um, in the racial climate and how that affects them as well. Um, so as we know, um, it affects us as adults, right? So clearly it is going to affect our youth as well. And some of the things that we may start to see or may have been seeing um, in our youth is that there is a sense of fear um, about not only their uh, physical health, but about their mental well being. Um, you know, this fear around am I going to uh, catch this virus? Is my are my family members going to catch this virus? So all of this is playing into the psyches of our youth and our families. Um, you may see some frustration um, and some boredom and loss of routine because kids have been sitting at home and they've been out of school. And a lot of times what our kids need um, is that sense of structure that they get from their daily routines of going to school. And now that has kind of been stripped from them. So there's an effect there. Um, there's also this wonder about, do we have adequate, adequate supplies within our home? Do we have enough food within our home? Um, are we getting the right information, right? We are being flooded daily by um, news feeds and social media 
about the virus, about racial tensions. And sometimes it becomes too much. It becomes too much for adults and it certainly becomes too much for, for our youth as well. Um, and then finally, the financial piece. And while some kids may not be aware of, um, of what's going on financially in the home, sometimes parents do a really good job of hiding all of that. Um, unfortunately, kids see everything, they feel everything. They, you know, they recognize when something is off. They recognize, especially our youth in underserved communities, recognize that there is a struggle um, to just get our basic needs met, um, food and, and things of that, of that nature. So these are some of the things that we're seeing in youth. Um, and that we need to be concerned about um, about as coaches. So, you know, just to talk a little bit about some of the studies that are out there, we know that in previous pandemics or in previous quarantine situations, we know that kids are more likely to experience things such as depression and anxiety um, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Um, you know, there, uh, there was a study that was done by Rutgers University that showed that Black teens experience severe forms um, of depression um, when, you come, when they're being, ex being exposed to uh, racial discrimination every day. And so um, we as coaches have to take note of that and we've got to figure out some ways to, to help our youth deal with those things, to help get them through these times. Um, you know, it certainly isn't easy for any of us, but they especially need our, our, our help. And I think that we as coaches, um, we may not be, you know, first responders during this time, but we certainly are second responders. We are the people that kids um, gravitate towards. We have close uh, contact and relationships with our youth. And so we certainly are uh, at least second responders in these situations. Um, so, uh, if we go, can you go to the next slide, Nate? Thanks. Okay. Um, so our role really is that um, what we work with with our coaches in trauma-informed uh, coaching is we give them the tools to be able to work with youth um, in these areas that, that really are traumatic for youth. Um, and so we know that you know, that sports um, helps with our physical sense of well-being, but also the emotional sense of well-being, and that kids are learning life skills and that they're learning uh, their sports skills. So all of these things are happening, and we're really that sort of change agent that comes into the life of the youth um, to facilitate that process. All right. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to kick it over to, um, to, uh, to Andy. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that um, what, what all of this suggests is that right now, um, like Ahada said, um, that there's really an enormous amount of stress coming down to young people um, from not only the pandemic, but also um, the things that are happening um, with um, with police, with protests, um, this environment uh, from all sides, stress is coming at us. Um, and so what we know is that a deep understanding as well as ways to figure out how to buffer stress are critical to both good mental health and to being a great athlete, right? Um, we need to perform at key moments of the game um, we need to be able to manage the stress that we feel in those times. Um, and then in our daily lives, we need to uh, manage the stress that we feel all over. So when we talk about the power of sports and the power of coaching, the ability to learn how to manage stress is really key. Um, so to dive a little bit deeper into what stress means for us, there are three basic kinds of stress. The first uh, is called acute stress. Uh, acute stress is that in the moment stress. Um, so something happens in a game, like you miss a big shot um, or something like that. Uh, your team's down in the waning seconds. That's acute stress right in that moment. Um, same in your life. You know, if you get uh, in a car accident, um, if you um, 
you know, have a, a project due for work or a project due at school, um, a big test coming up, that's acute stress. Acute stress is just in the moment. And usually when the stressor, that thing that's causing you to feel stress, when that subsides, so when the game's over, when you finally finish that test, when you get at work, then the stress and the feelings of stress subside. Uh, the second kind of stress is called episodic acute stress. And that's something that's more like a recurring stressor. Um, so it's something like a family living in poverty, having um, bills due every month. Um, that's something that you, you predict and you kind of look forward to that stress in a really negative way. Episodic acute stress um, feels like it's accumulating more. Um, it can be harder to deal with, though, you manage um, when you have someone supporting you to buffer that stress. So things like financial assistance, um, a routine class that you're having a hard time with, maybe it has a great teacher too. Um, these supports that you can have, like great teachers or coaches or mentors, those buffer the stress of episodic acute stress um, so that it doesn't uh, cause too much permanent damage. The third kind is called chronic stress, and sometimes this gets called toxic stress. Um, so this is a kind of stress that is unrelenting and unbuffered. Um, brain science has a lot of um, research into this, but chronic stress can actually change the physical shape of the brain, um, can change the way that we think, can change our patterns of behavior. Um, and that's the really important thing is that stress in influences our behavior. Uh, Nate's going to talk a little bit about that more as we go on. Um, so chronic stress can, can come from things like um, consistently living in poverty, um, having uh, exposure to violence, um, both on a constant basis or in a single large place. Um, but chronic stress is a grinding stress. There's lots of research to show that kids who've experienced chronic stress, um, their resting heart rate is much higher. So it's like they're sprinting all the time. Um, chronic stress can destroy lives, bodies, and minds. Um, it really wreaks havoc uh, through attrition, like a gradual erosion of our sense of resilience. Um, so going to the next slide, um, we want to be able to think about what in our lives is stressful. You know, what are those little stressors in life? Um, you can think of your own little stresses, um, things like traffic, um, being late to an appointment, um, going to work, uh, what's going on with your kids, paying bills, school, um, not being able to locate a bathroom when you need one, or losing your cell phone charger and you see it's at 1%. Um, when one of these things happens, you know, what happens to our bodies? Right, we feel that um, tingling the extremities, right, we start to stress, to sweat. You know, I wish that I could control that um, impulse, but it just happens on its own, right? Our muscles tense up, our hearts beat faster. And it's actually, interestingly, the same thing that happens when you're doing physical activity. Um, physical activity is a way to practice being stressed, right? When we're physically active, going on a run, playing basketball, um, hockey, football, um, really any sport, same thing happens, right? Our muscles get tense. We get that um, feeling of, of tingling in our extremities. Um, we, our hearts beat faster. Um, and uh, that physical experience of stress is the same in the mind. The cool difference between physical activity and stressors um, externally that you can't control is that you can stop when you're being physically active. And that crucial difference between the stress of physical activity and the stresses that we can't control means that physical activity can actually help us practice reducing our stress. When we get to control the um, physical symptoms of stress and when we practice calming down after physical activity, that helps our bodies and minds calm when we uh, interact with stressors that we can't control. Um, this is just one of the great um, benefits of physical activity and sport um, that, that really comes through when we practice these things and we, we practice regulating our stress response. Um, like I said, Nate is going to be here to talk a little bit more about how this kind of stress can impact our behavior and why it's so important that we practice controlling it. So I'm going to hand it off to Nate right now. Thanks, Andy. So we've <laughs> talked about, we understand that there are a lot of stressors that are happening to people right now, and, and those stressors affect us. They affect our bodies and the three different types of stress. But stress itself, 
when we talk about stress, it's not even inherently good or bad, right? It, it, it just is. And it's our experiences and how we respond to that stress that can be good or bad. It's that good stress that our high-end athletes, right, can harness for competition, can harness to finish that project, to hit that di- deadline, or it could be the bad stress that just overfloods our system and maybe leads us to some unhealthy reactions, some unhealthy choices, right? And so as coaches, I want you to think, when you experience bad stress, when you get overflooded by the system, you think that you're your optimal best, are you focused, are you at your best performance and self-awareness? And she's probably no, right? We're probably not at our very best whenever that bad stress overfloods our system and overtakes us. Inherently, all of us naturally are wired, our brains are wired and created to respond to stress. You and I were created to respond to stress. And I want to show you a couple pieces of the brain. Of course, we know the brain stem controls all those things that we don't need to think about. Uh, breathe, blinking, all of those things. That's what the brain stem controls. But I want to point to this little section in the middle, this thing called the amygdala, which is a Greek word that means almond. It's very small and it has one primal function. And that function is to look for stressors, it's to look around, find out what might be able to hurt us, and then to quickly put us into action. It's supposed to help us be able to respond with our fight, flight, or freeze. And when that amygdala takes over, when that amygdala is triggered, when that amygdala senses a stressor that needs to respond, it actually pulls resources away from that front portion of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. That's our rational thought of our brain. It's right here in the, in the center. It's right in the front. It's large. It's in charge. And that's what makes us us. It's our rational thinking portion of our brain. And when our amygdala takes over, when our amygdala is triggered, when our amygdala floods our system, it takes over and takes resources from that portion of the brain and puts those resources into portions of our brain and body that helps us respond to stress to keep us alive. Now, this might sound like fuzzy brain science, but it's actually not. I'm going to show you two scans here. The scan on the left, this comes from a healthy brain. This is the blood flow, the energy of that brain. And you can see that a lot of energy is towards the front. It's in that prefrontal cortex. It's in that thinking portion of the brain. It is in charge. We are in charge. We can think and we can make rational decisions. Then there's the brain on the right. This is a brain that has experienced a lot of that chronic stress, a lot of those big stressors. And you can see that that blood flow has flowed away from the front of the brain. It's flowed away from the prefrontal cortex. And they have a very highlighted spot towards the back, which is where that amygdala lies. And so that amygdala has pulled resources away because it has decided that we need to respond to one of our stressors. So As coaches, as parents, as adults, when we work with young people, or even if we look in the mirror, what are some of the behaviors that we see when we're triggered? When we experience one of these stressors, when we get ourselves in a place that bad stress has over flooded the system, what are some of those things that we see? What are some of the behaviors that we see that come through? These are those triggers. Maybe they're impulsivity, right? Maybe it's emotional dysregulation. I'm just kind of all over the place. I'm not really myself. Maybe I'm aggressive, more aggressive than I normally am. Maybe I've pulled away and and I don't want to be social when I'm normally very social. Maybe I just lack self-awareness or I begin to shut down and pull away. These are all behaviors. These are things, these are triggers that we know uh, are showing that the amygdala has taken over and maybe we're not experiencing good stress, but instead we're experiencing bad stress. And this is really important. What happens? When we're triggered, when we're experiencing these bad stress moments, what are we thinking? As coaches, we ask that a lot. Like, what were you thinking out there? And the truth is, now that we know this, now that we've seen these scans, now that we understand very quickly how the brain responds to stress, what are we thinking in those moments where the amygdala has taken over and the bad stress has over flooded our system? The truth is, we're not thinking. We're not able to think because the thinking takes place in that prefrontal cortex, I'm able to rationally make decisions in my prefrontal cortex. And when my amygdala has taken over, whenever I'm experiencing a traumatic event and that amygdala takes over to keep me alive, then in that moment, I'm not able to think. The control to make rational thought has been taken away from me 
and I'm doing the very best that I can in that moment. And that is very powerful to understand that perspective as coaches, as adults, even for ourselves, if we look in the mirror, to understand that when we experience something very traumatic, that our brains are actually biologically responding to keep us alive and that we are doing the very best that we can in that moment. And then what happens is this rewiring begins to take place. Whenever I experience a lot of big, heavy, traumatic moments, a rewiring takes place to where now, I respond that way with all triggers. I respond with a, a, a 10 reaction, even though maybe it's a two experience because I've been rewired. I've experienced so many of these traumatic experiences that my brain immediately triggers the amygdala. It puts me in my fight, flight, or freeze mechanism, and it's trying to keep me alive. We are doing the best that we can. And to understand that our youth or even ourselves, when we're triggered, we're not actually thinking in that moment. There's really, really great news. And that great news is that not only can sports help us heal, as Andy talked about, because it is really great practice about learning how to control ourselves and to control the different things that happen to our body, but it also provides us a coach. You. It provides you. And you are a caring adult relationship. And we know that through the research that's, that is out there that a caring adult relationship creates a space where young people can heal. Because you and I as humans, we heal through relationships. And that's why at Up to Us Sports, we design all of our training to supply as many tools to coaches as we possibly can. Because we want to create as many safe spaces as we can for young people so that they can experience the healing of not only through sports and being physically active, but also having a caring adult relationship that is helping me heal through relationships. And we think that today is going to be a big starting spot, a great place that we can start healing through all of the great conversations that we're going to have. And to share a couple of quick resources, I want to toss it over to Ahada. Thanks, Nate. Um, so yeah, so here are resources that we have available um, at Up to Us Sports and some of the things that we ask our coaches to, to use as well as just coaches in general. And the first one is our Up to Us Sports at Home page. And this is just a, a plethora of um, videos, workouts, things that, uh, that youth and coaches can use while we're distancing at home to keep yourselves active, to keep your bodies moving. Um, you'll see, get a lot of information on there about how you can use coaching techniques, how you can engage your, um, your youth while we're, while we're distancing. So that's one, of the, uh, that's one of them. And you can get that at um, uptous.org slash home. Okay. The second one is one that's near and dear to my heart because I have girls, um, I have two daughters, I coach girls, um, and it's really been sort of my passion to empower girls through sports. And so we have partnered with Adidas uh, to uh, implement our digital curriculum, which is keepgirlsinsports.com. And that is a, uh, a course that anyone can take. Again, if you're a coach, if you are a mentor of young girls, um, that is a curriculum that you can take that goes through some real strategies on, number one, how we keep girls engaged in sports, because we know that girls are dropping out of sports at twice the rate of boys by the age of 14. Um, and so we really need to uh, do our due diligence and make sure that we're using strategies to keep our girls to keep our girls engaged so that they're, you know, benefiting from sports the same as boys are. Um, and so that's that curriculum. Um, and then if you want to give us some feedback about the information that we've presented or any information that we give in terms of our online resources, um, you can go to our surveymonkey.com as well and give us some feedback. So, um, so listen, I really want to appreciate you guys for taking the time to go through this training with us. Hopefully you got some good information about just about where we are today in the climate and the stress that that's putting on families and on youth. And hopefully you have some ideas about how can I manage this a little bit differently? How can I manage it a little bit better moving forward? How can we help youth manage it a little bit moving forward? Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to kick it back over to you, Megan. 
Thank you, uh, Andy, Ahada, and Neil for um, all of that. Sorry, Nate, I apologize um, for all of that and that information. I, I actually just learned a few things from that presentation um, and I'm sure those on our esteemed panel uh, also learned as well too, once again, for, for those, I'm Megan McPeak of Monumental Sports and Entertainment. And this is a crucial conversation and helping our athletes and our young athletes learn to cope with everything going on today. You have COVID-19 and being quarantined. And, you know, you think of the seniors in the eighth grade, you know, 12th grade and college seniors and university seniors who their lives have kind of been upheld because of being stuck at home. And um, they you also add in the social unrest that's happening in the country um, as well too at this time. And with, with that, I would like to welcome in our panel members, my broadcast partner, Christy Winter Scott, after an illustrious playing career at Maryland and 10 plus years coaching at the college level, she joined the broadcasting world covering everything hoops. And she's a double Hall of Famer, not only at South Lakes, but as well at the University of Maryland. Jennifer Brown, a learner working to ensure all young people have an opportunity to thrive in their role and in her role as deputy director for the Aspen Institute Sports and Society Program. Eton Thomas, a former NBA player, but he is defying the stereotypical athlete and redefining himself as the activist athlete. So a very esteemed panel, um, and I'm really grateful to be able to have a conversation with you all and Dr. Um, Cummings, I'll start with you first, just based off of the presentation, since it's still fresh in people's minds that might be watching. For uh, the trauma training that you do with your coaches, is there any tips or pointers that you would be able to give uh, coaches or parents that are watching this right now um, that may be seeing some of those signs and triggers that you and Andy and Nate mentioned on what they can maybe do to assist with you know, their, their youths. And I don't want this to just be about athletes as well too, because in this situation, all, all people and all youths are affected by this. Sure, sure. I would say first off, Megan, um, that we need to be mindful about the amount of information that our youth are absorbing. And that, you know, we're in a day where social media, you can get to anything on social media, you can watch anything on the TV, um, but sometimes it's too much. It's certainly too much for me um, as an adult, um, and I know how to disconnect from it, but we need to learn how to help our youth disconnect. Um, you know, it's not healthy. It's certainly healthy to be informed, but it's not healthy to be flooded um, with visions and, and hearing things that are traumatic, that are traumatic, and that you may not have the right person to, um, to help you contextualize all of this and make you understand it and put it in context. And so that would be my first, um, my first suggestion is take some time to disconnect, disconnect from it. Um, another thing that we as coaches can do to help youth is to help them start regulating um, those, recognizing number one, what their triggers are, recognizing when their, how their stress shows up for them, um, but also giving them tools to decompress and to get rid of the stress. So whether it's breathing exercises, whether it's you have to learn how to meditate, whether it's you know using sports as your way of dealing with um, or exercising as your way of dealing with stress, we've got to help our youth recognize that there are things that they can control. So when I do things, when I've done consulting in the past with athletes, you know, the one thing that we always tell them, and this goes for anybody, is that there are certain things that we have control over and things that we don't. And you start to get more stressed and more anxiety when you start to focus on those things that you have no control over. And so help our youth identify what can I control in this situation? Can I control you know, my thoughts? Can I control my emotions? Can I control the decisions that I make? And help our youth develop a plan of action for doing those things, staying focused on those things that we can control and then discarding or letting some of those things that we can't control 
fall by the wayside um, because that, this, that just then creates more anxiety. So we do have some questions that were submitted and I want to make sure I get to those as quickly as possible um, for those that could be watching. So John from Arlington uh, said he's a white male and a high school basketball coach at a predominantly black school. What steps sh should I be taking right now? For yourself a basketball coach, you're also a mother and you are right now engulfed in what is going on as well too. So I'll start with you and then I'd like to get a ton your thoughts on that as well too. Well, I just think that, you know, as a mom first, um, I think that being a parent helps me um, in my role as a high school basketball coach. And I coached in college for 10 years, coached, uh, this is my 15th year, I'm um, coaching in high school and I've never obviously seen a situation like this. I mean, we've had snow days that have taken, you know, two or three days and we're like, oh my goodness, there was once a 10 day snow day. But I mean, this has been so um, contentious mentally um, for not just the student athletes, not just for my children, but for me, it's been difficult. So you're not only trying to navigate for these young people, but you're also personally navigating at the same time. And you know, that sometimes is, is difficult. So I appreciate being on this panel because that's, it's really helping me to see the bigger picture, um, to decompress. I know I've told my, my kids to take the phones uh, and put them away because everything is, is so traumatizing, like you said, and um, it's just really uh, depressing and sad just to see the same stories over and over again or the continuation of, of the same things happening. And then as a parent and a coach not to be able to um, explain why. I think that is um, the the biggest um, stopper for me in terms of uh, where do I proceed and in terms of explaining how to navigate it. And I think we're all in the same boat and I think that they respect that. And I think they can see that as a coach. You know, I try to, you know, incorporate a lot of online things with the kids just to keep them engaged. Um, we have a fundraiser coming up just because we've lost our summer camp. So there are a lot of things um, that that go deeper than just, hey, I can't play basketball right now. There are a lot of um, personal relationships on teams. As you know, if you've played sports that, I mean, that supersedes wins and losses. I mean, you remember your friends on the team. You remember the relationships that you build throughout. And I think as parents, we're personally responsible for, you know, keeping them engaged. And I think, you know, if we didn't have this technology right now, I don't know how this would feel. Um, and if I'm coming through as a teenager, this would be <laughs> extremely detrimental because um, just to be able to see people, I think, is healthy. And just to be able to reconnect with your teammates and, and your friends, I think, is a healthy thing during this time. And um, I think it's, it's really paramount for us as community leaders and as parents to not only see that 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 is important for our children but to also you know talk to our friends too you know it can't just be telling the children and the players what to do but but also take heed as well um, as a personal um, vote of, of advice and I think for for me you know just staying in touch with friends I think that has been uh, a tremendous help, but I think just encouraging uh, personal interaction, whatever that uh, medium is on, I think is an invaluable advice that we can give our kids and, and for the people who are having questions about what to do and how to explain it to, um, to the kids. And it's just tell them that you honestly are going through it with them, right? It's nothing that you can give them top down. It's like we're all in this at the same time going through it together. So I think the more you can be relatable to the kids, the easier it is for them to understand how to move forward. Etan, you're a white male at a predominantly black school and how he can help his athletes. Well, I think for one thing, um, and thank you for letting me be a part of this, of this very important discussion. Um, I, I coach my, uh, my son's AAU team, and I think one of the things that I've learned that I have to do as a coach is be able to listen to them. So I give them the, the space to be able to tell me how they're feeling. You know, a lot of times, you know, as adults, we want to come in 
and just talk, 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 talk. You know, so, so I'll come in and I won't say anything. I'll just say, okay, I want y'all to talk to me. Tell me what you're feeling. Uh, tell me what you're thinking. And I'll do the same thing with my kids. And, um, you know, doing that with my, with my kids, uh, I, I learned that my son, Malcolm, you know, he needed a little bit of a break. He needed a break. He, needed, he, he wasn't sleeping well. You know, he was, he, was, he was waking up in the middle of the night, everything like that. He's worried about everything. And he needed a break from everything. So then we took a little break. You know, we didn't talk about everything. We, you know, I, I let him have that moment until he was telling me that he was ready to come back and start learning some more. And I think that's just really important for us to, to listen to young people. Um, you know, a lot of times we don't, we don't know what to do, but we want to guide them so much. But they have so many feelings, so many thoughts, so many things, emotions that they're dealing with. And they learn from each other. And, I, and I've, I've learned that when you get young people in a group, once they start talking, then it's like it's going all over the place. But that you have to get them to start first. Because at first, nobody really wants to talk. Nobody wants to put themselves out there and you know, let everybody know that they're struggling with this or struggling with this. So they all kind of play it cool. But then once you break that ice, then it's just like a you know, free for all. Everybody's pouring and, and telling how they feel and everything like that. And I think that's really so what I would tell the coach, uh, the white coach with his players, um, get them on, you know, right now we're in social distancing, everything. So maybe you can even do this on Zoom and just let them express themselves. And then you have a discussion because a lot of times they'll guide you with what they need. You know, a lot of times we think we know what they need, but they'll tell us if we give them the opportunity to tell us. Jennifer, your thoughts on, on this situation as well, too? Yeah, so, I mean, I think... Um, Christy and Itan have said exactly what I was going to say. We recently had a young African-American athlete participate in an event that um, we held. And the advice that he wanted coaches to hear was simple and very poignant. He said, don't talk at me, talk with me. And I think at this moment in time that um, coaches should even take that step one, one, take that one step farther and say um, that they're willing to talk with their players. Um, and that they should be willing to come into these conversations ready to listen, but more, more importantly, um, listen to ideas and be willing to take action. Um, because I think that uh, we've learned that young people take uh, leadership guidance from the adults as well. And so it isn't just about listening, but it's about the changes that um, you can make moving forward. Now this next one, um, it kind of, it, it sh shook me a little bit, um, not so much the question, but the fact it was from a seven-year-old, uh, Jonah, age seven from DC. And, and um, anyone can, can answer this uh, to start. How can we use sports to help advance racial justice? And I was blown away that a seven-year-old had that thought process. Um, so I posed that question to the panel. How can we use sports to help advance racial justice um i could i could jump in with this one if everyone's okay with it you know i i've used as an examples to my kids um you know just showing them different athletes using their positions and using their platforms and i'm showing them everything that is going on in the news from kyrie irving form, forming his group and what they're trying to push for to be able to go to each city and push the ceos and the teams to be able to use their influence to be able to, you know, go towards police reform. Um, me and my, my son Malcolm and Imani, uh, she's 12 years old, Malcolm 14. We just had that discussion yesterday. Um, you know, baby Sierra, I call her baby Sierra. She's nine years old, but she's, she's my baby Sierra. Um, so we have those discussions as well. So I show her different things, um, you know, and, and young people can be inspired by athletes. So it's good to show them athletes doing things like that. I remember my, my son saw Giannis, um, speaking at a, at a rally and he was so hyped and so proud and everything like that. And we were just, you know, watching John Wall and Bradley Beal, uh, they're marching at, you know, during Juneteenth and they're having a Black Lives Matter shirts on and, you know, declaring that they want things to change and everything like that. And uh, my son Malcolm was inspired, you know, so showing young people, athletes doing these things uh, is definitely inspiration for them. I, I'm going to tag on to that as well. And, and, I was at that march today, Megan, you were there as well. And just to be able to see the unification 
of sports. I think that answers that young man's question. At seven years old, the wisdom of that is insane. But just to, to understand that everyone is on the same page, everyone is frustrated, everyone wants to see a change. And when you see um, professional athletes step to the microphone, step to the table and say, I am in the same boat with you. I feel the frustrations and the anger and we have to do something and they have the platform to make that change and be a vocal uh, pinpoint for the community. And Natasha Cloud with the Washington Mystics has been outstanding in terms of using her platform and her role as a professional athlete. So I think the unification of sports is what is so important right now for our youth to see. I mean, you have people from different socioeconomic situations, you have different races, different levels of experience, but at the end of the day, you're on one team. And I think the more you can show that, the more you can display that, um, the better off our young people will be. It's not just about who scores the most points. It's about one team coming together for a common goal. And Bradley Beal said that today as well. Like five fingers, if you hit somebody with five fingers, it's not going to hurt as much as when your fist is together. And it's it's a unification piece that I think we all need to to realize. And it, it, it supersedes sports. It's It's about our our livelihoods. It's about us as parents. It's about us as coaches. And, and it's about us as teammates. I mean, we're all teammates with one another. And I think when we see that kind of unification, that lifts us and motivates us and keeps us on the right track in terms of staying together. The next one, um, oh. But I'd like to get your thoughts on this first, because I think with this question, there is a uh, mental health aspect to it that could be um, playing a role, whether positive or negative. And um, it's an anonymous 14-year-old from Bowie, Maryland. And they say, my father is an AAU coach. He's also a police officer. One of my teammates tweeted hashtag ACAB the other day. I'm trying to educate myself and be supportive of Black Lives Matter, but at the same time, he's my dad and they know him and I'm really struggling with this. So for some, someone in a situation like that, especially a 14 year old, and you know, there are professional athletes that have family members um, that are on the law enforcement side of things. So they see both sides, especially you know, athletes of color. Dr. McCummings, from a mental 14-year-old in that situation, knowing that his dad is, is trying, but his teammates are also now um, showing that they don't support, um, they don't support law enforcement. Yeah, I think, you know, this is, this is, it's, it's almost heartbreaking because it's, you know, this, this child, this youth is in a position of being torn emotionally, right, about two worlds, two different worlds. And I think that what I would say to this particular young man is that you can, um, you know, I think that what's been happening in the media is that you have to pick a side. Either you are with Black Lives Matter or you are with police departments. And it doesn't allow for people to understand that there's a middle ground somewhere, right? And so what I would say to this young person, because he's not unlike, you know, thousands, millions of others who are in that same position, is that you can support Black Lives Matter and support your father and that there's nothing wrong with doing both of those things. You can be, um, I, you know, I attended a march not too long ago in which uh, we were in the streets marching and we had the support of the police department who some of them were marching along with us. And so I think that from a mental health perspective that you let, we need to let young men like him know that it's not his responsibility um, to make anyone think or change their opinions about anybody else. And that the only thing that he can do is do what's comfortable for him. And that is loving his father and loving his teammates. 
And he doesn't have to be the go between between, you know, for the for the two to meet. He can be supportive on both ends. And I think that what's important to recognize is that young people sometimes tend to take on the responsibility and the onus becomes on them to make everybody okay. And so um, what we need to, to let them know is that that's not their responsibility. His teammates have a responsibility in understanding what's going on in the police department. The police department has, and his father has a responsibility to understand and recognize what's going on in the community. And that that is not all encompassing on him. Um, and so it, it, it just, you know, this is going to, if not, um, someone to step in to give him that perspective, that's an awesome responsibility for a child to carry around and to think that it's theirs to bear. Um, and so, I, like I said, when you read this question, I just, you know, my heart broke because, again, this is, this is the times that we're in that people are taking on so much um, and that's good to be active, but there are some things that you cannot take on. You just can't. And we need to help our youth and help people understand that there are things that you cannot take on. There's only so much you can do. Jennifer, Eton, Christy, do uh, any of you want to chime in uh, on the tail end of what uh, Ahada just said? I'll just tag super quickly. Um, one of my daughter's friends from basketball has actually two parents who are police officers, but they're also interracial. So there's a whole plethora of issues um, in that situation, obviously. But we've been texting back and forth throughout this entire you know, month where it's just been uh, really tough for her. Um, but she had um, a, a community walk and she said she did it in uniform and, and she's African-American and her husband is Caucasian. And she said, just imagine how I felt in that moment, uh, walking in the community as an African-American woman. It's just, I mean, I, I just told her that I loved her and told her to be careful. Um, but just to have that kind of dynamic, I know is, is incredibly tough but there's always a way to show again the the unification and the unity and you know there are good-hearted compassionate people who care about others and um she showed that while she walked in her uniform i think that's great and i think one of the things we have to do is just re remind our our kids that you know what they see when they look on the news because kids watch the news you know they're watching on the social media and everything and they see the lines being drawn in the sand um, that I had talked about. And they, they, it's very apparent. And we just have to keep on telling them that, no, that that's not what it is. Um, like you said, you can be for Black Lives Matter and also be in support of the police. Like I've done so many different events with police and I like to have police at my events be, because it is bridging the gap and showing that, okay, you know, not all police are the way that I, that I thought that they were. And then, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of disheartening when you see that 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 broad stroke that broad brush being painted every time you look on the news and you just have to keep reinforcing to young people that no being pro-black doesn't mean anti-white you know being pro-black doesn't mean that you're against the police you know it means that you want the, the way that we police to be able to be better in this country and there's a big difference and it's just you know it's like i said it's tough because Everything that there's being shown once they turn on the news is is kind of like it's just one or the other. And I've talked, I've spoken to so many different, you know, white allies. Like now we're at a time where this is probably, I'm not going to say probably, it definitely is in my lifetime, the most white people that I've seen protesting over an issue, you know, where a black man was killed by the police. Most that I've ever seen. And so a lot of times um, in, in having these conversations, these debates, these discussions, you know, even at rallies, you know, a lot of white people are saying, you know, I thought it was one thing. Like, I always thought that it was like against all police. Or even when we're discussing what defund the police means. And they're like, well, we thought that it meant disband. I'm like, but disband and disfund are two different words. You know, defund doesn't mean disband. And it's just really just, you know, breaking down certain things. But people have like preconceived notions of, you know, kind of stuck in their mind of what they believe. Like, I, it, it's, it's, but that's where communication comes in. 
And a lot of times, especially in the media right now, we'll have shouting matches where nobody's really listening to each other. They're just kind of shouting at each other. And it's dramatic and it makes for good TV and it gets the ratings. And that's what that, you know, people like. But if we could have just dialogue and people could actually hear each other, and it's happening, it's happening more now than I think it has really ever before, that where you see different people coming over as allies who weren't allies, like, like Drew Brees. Drew Brees had one thought, he saw that it was hurtful, and he, had, and he started thinking about it. And then he changed his whole tune. He's like, okay, I want to be an ally. I thought it was this. I thought that when you're taking me, it was disrespectful to the flag. I thought it was disrespectful to the veterans. And then you had Malcolm Jenkins say, he was like, well, no, I, my grandfather's a veteran too. You know what I mean? I love my grandfather. That's not what it means at all. It means this. So then you have the dialogue, and that's what's so important. And that's what's happening so much. And it's really been encouraging me to see how much has been happening right now. Yeah, and I'm happy to jump in and just say, I mean, I think what we're talking about is a really important skill that particularly young people around age 14 are beginning to develop, which is around perspective taking. Um, and this is something that I think sports offer such an incredible opportunity to hone and develop. Um, you know, think about when you're the winner versus when you're the loser and you have two very different perspectives on how the game went. Um, and you really can begin to step back and put yourself in someone else's shoes and begin to see their point of view. And I think this moment in time is encouraging us and, and pushing us to have those conversations and to educate ourselves so that we can um, understand the perspective of both sides and begin to make the right choice for ourselves. Yeah, and th that's a great point, Jennifer. And you all made very great points. And you know, to to, to your point, and the dialogue that is happening, um, it's so interesting to see the you know the flip of the switch to now everyone is saying, well, we get why Colin Kaepernick knelt in the first place. And the biggest thing that was forgotten about that was it was actually a veteran who told him kneeling would be more respectful than sitting on the bench. But everyone forgot about that because there was no dialogue. And I always, um, I always like to, to say that, you know, we were, when we were created as humans, we were created with one mouth and two ears for a reason. And I think with everything going on now, we're actually starting to use our two ears more than the one mouth we were given. So it's, it's very interesting to see this. Um, the next one I will uh, I will pose. First, with you on this, and you not quite that simple. Um, in wealthier families, participation is trending up, whereas participation amongst low-income families has plummeted. What changes should we be making to the youth sports landscape to support? to uh, make sure sports remains accessible to everyone. Yeah, you know, thanks for this question. I, I think it's a really important one at, at this point in time. And, you know, unfortunately, um, particularly in the youth sports landscape, we've moved to a pay for play model, which has um, in some cases eliminated the free and low cost opportunities that exist. And so right now, as we have this moment in time in which we are looking to both um, recover, rebuild, refresh all of the institutions that we have in our community. I think that we need to think about how we prioritize um, low to no cost sport opportunities. We need to think about the spaces within our communities that bring us together, um, that allow us to gather. And they don't necessarily have to be organized sports leagues. I mean, you can see over this time, you know, in my neighborhood in particular, the number of pickup um, soccer games that happen now because we have a little small patch of grass that is uh, being currently claimed as a, a, a mini soccer field. Um, it is really changing the dynamic of, of what we think of in sport. And I also think because we've spent, as my children like to tell me, 90 days um, in our house together, um, we've really created a lot of new activities that have kept us active. And I think that these are things that we can begin to share um, with community and they are with our neighbors, with our community, and they are not expensive activities. Um, it might be 
Um, it might be pickup soccer, like I mentioned. It might be any of these new obstacle course games that my children have loved to create it that have, that have kept them active. But um, I think that there are some critical institutions which we really need to, um, as we move forward, think about how we ensure that there are low to no cost opportunities, our parks and recs departments, our schools, or other community-based organizations. Um, and this is um, opportunities in which communities in particular can reinvest dollars um, to ensure that there are places, not just for young people, but for families to gather and be active together. Itan or Christy, you're both coaches, as you mentioned. Do either of you wanna to touch on you know, your thoughts on how you can uh, make sports more accessible as opposed to it being a conversation that if you have money, you can play. If you don't have money, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck in a way. Well, I think there's, there's always a way. Um, I think as a coach and, you know, at our, at our high school, there are different levels of um, financial stability for, for each of our players in our program. And for me, if I had a hard and fast rule um, in, in terms of gear and shoes and practice gear and everything like that, um, I, I, there would be a lot of unhappy people. Um, I'm a mom of three, all three of them play sports. It's expensive, period. Um, and there's no way around that um, in terms of saying it, but there are ways to let the coaches know that you're having difficulty, but you really want to play and, you know, you really want to participate. You earned your spot in tryouts for this team. And, you know, you would hate to turn someone away because they can't pay for their shoes or their uniform. It's just not right. So, I mean, compassion, and that's the word that keeps coming to me today in this discussion over everything, but you have to have compassion and you have to understand what people are going through, especially now. Um, where people have lost their jobs, people have been out of work for months, people don't know where their next uh, check is coming from. So you have to have a high level of compassion and work with people and allow them to pay as they can or, or help them. I know in our budget, um, we have a budget for kids who have issues with paying. So there has to be um, a, a handshake on, on how to make it work and make it um, accommodating for everyone at every financial level. And, and maybe the people who have a lot of money are going to look at that and say, well, why do I have to pay? And we've seen that too, unfortunately. Uh, but if you can pay for it, you can pay for it, but some people cannot. And so we're going to help those people. And I think it's a microcosm of what we see in society as well, right? I think it's just um, a societal issue that trickles into athletics. But again, there's always a way to solve it. There's always a way to have a compassionate person at the top who understands your plight and will work with you so you can't miss out on a chance to participate in sports, which we know on here is so invaluable in terms of experience as a, a growing young person. And just to add to that, you know, I, I have, you know, three, three children and both my daughters play volleyball. We, we just got into Metro Volleyball. It's a wonderful program, but it's expensive. You know what I mean? It's expensive. And, my, you know, I coach my son's AU team. Uh, so, we, you know, we're a church team, First Baptist Church of Glen Arden here. And we don't turn people away because they can't pay. Yeah, um, the AU, AU can get really expensive really quickly. You're traveling all over the place, I mean, really quickly. And one of the things that we encourage as a program is that we encourage raising money, you know, having fundraisers. We're out there doing car washes, um, you know, advertising on social media. We're doing some car washes and getting, and honestly, for young people, my experience has been that they appreciate it more when they have to earn it or they feel like they earned it. Um, you know, that there's a, there's a way that young people can get spoiled very quickly. You know what I mean? Even if they, you know, they don't have money, not saying that they have a lot of money, they just given stuff and they just get spoiled really quickly. So really having them earn it, um, they walk around with pride and they walk around with the, you know, cause they know they have that feeling that they, that they, that they, that they earned this, you know, and they take care of it better. You know, when they want to know exactly where their stuff is, they don't just come in and throw it all over the place, you know, in the gym and they're not even thinking about it because they didn't earn it that way. It was just given to them. 
But when they've earned it, when they know they was out in the hot sun all day doing car washes to get these sneakers, oh, they they taking care of them. They do it with the toothbrush like back in the day, like cleaning them and everything like that. And it's really honestly beautiful to see. I mean, I'm, I'm older now, so I want to see like, you know, lessons being taught to the young people and everything like that. And that's where I think AAU can really be a learning tool. I mean, this is how my AAU was when I was growing up. I, 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 I um, played for, for the church team, my church team um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, you know, our coach was also the pastor. And he, I mean, he talked to us about life. He talked to us about, you know, it, the basketball was just one part. You know, that was just like the, the way to get, you know, to us. But everything else, I mean, I, I, we learned. And that, I think that's the, the, the beauty of AAU sports, that you can use it to really build young men and women and build their character and mold their character and have them hold them accountable for things and not have them be expected. I mean, you can mold them really at a young age because if they're, if they're given everything and taught that they walk on water and they have special privileges when they're young, it's just going to get worse once they get older. So, you know, for youth sports, there's a lot that you can do with it on the positive side. We just have to make sure that we, you know, get more positivity in there because there's also that negative side that only wants to win at all costs. And that's the part where, you know, that's the tough part because they accept anything, you know, and it builds little monsters, (laughs) to be quite honest, like little, and then like the parents and everything, it's, it's, it's a whole different thing, but it can be done right. I've seen it done too many times, you know, to know that it can definitely be done right. Before we wrap up, uh, Ahada, I'd like to get your um, aspect on this topic, especially, you know, to Atan's point of the negative and the positive and, and talking about, you know, with his team as the example of no, no player gets turned away from a, you know, a mental health aspect. How tough can that be for, you know, third? 14, 15 year olds who, because they are not big. I'm losing you, Megan. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I I wanted your um your mental uh your mental aspect insight on the negative and positive of a player who their family may not be in that financial situation to play and how they can, you know, handle that and how tough that can be. Sure. Sure. So I think that, you know, um, rejection, right. Is devastating for all of us. Um, and that is a form of rejection. You know what I mean? That I cannot participate in a sport, um, because I'm not on a certain financial level to be able to do so. Um, And so I think that the effects of that then become, that is where you see why girls are not participating as much because there is this cost thing that happens. And so what I hate to see is for girls to then sort of uh, squash their dreams, right? Of being able to participate in a sport and, and then gravitating towards something that's not as healthy simply because they can't participate due to due to financial reasons. Um, and so that's what we see is that, you know, it's almost like this, um, you know, it's like this, this feeling of what's the point, you know, um, moving forward at this point. If I can't do this, if I can't play sports, if I can't play basketball or, or that sport that I love, then what's the point in all of this? And that is devastating, um, especially for girls. So, you know, I think, you know, as Etan said, you know, we really have to start making sure as programs that this is a priority. It's got to be a priority. It's got to be a priority in schools. It's got to be a priority in programs. Etan, my daughter, I have two daughters that played volleyball. Both are playing in college. One graduated and she's played overseas. It's expensive. It's expensive. However, 
what she gained from that experience, would she have gone and lived in London and played in London had she not played sports? Probably not. And so how tragic is it that some kids don't get to experience that, don't get the value that comes with being an athlete? Because it's not just, you know, the kudos because you're playing a sport. She's traveled. She's, you know, met people from other countries. She's experienced all of these things because she was involved in sports. And so that needs to happen for every kid that wants to be involved in sports. And I think it's incumbent upon us. I, you know, I coach as well. I coach high school volleyball. I own a club as well. And I started my program because we lived in an area where girls were in an underserved area and did not have the opportunities to play. And so when they were playing in high school, they were getting beat, you know, by the teams whose girls were playing club. And how tragic is that for these girls who are just as, um, you know, just as talented not to have the same opportunity. And so we've got to open the space, like you said, Christy, to say, hey, listen, I'm going to take on a certain number of scholarship athletes in my program. I've got, it's got to be up on me to reach out to organizations, NFL, NBA, <laughs> WNBA, all of these organizations who now are saying, hey, listen, we want to put money into the communities and make sure that um, underserved youth are getting an opportunity and that we can get rid of this racial divide that's happening within sports, well, then I think that it's incumbent upon us, right? Program, uh, program people who are running programs, coaches, to hold some feet to the fire to say, here's a program. I need you to do that. I need you to do that. I need you to support that. Um, and so that we don't have these girls and these boys that are young and feeling devalued simply because they didn't have an opportunity to play. I think that's a, a great point to end on. Um, to my esteemed panel, Dr. Ahadama Cummings, Jennifer Brown Lerner, Eton Thomas, Winter Scott, thank you to all of you for this conversation. I think it was needed and necessary. And um, to the Up To Us team of Nate Lejeune, Andy Nielsen, and Dr. Ahada McCummings for your presentation. Um, thank you as well, too. You've been watching a true, true needed conversation, a very crucial conversation, a way that we can help our youth athletes cope.